Shirley, would you mind coming up? And I'm, she has a word for the body of Christ in a general, not just this body, but entire body. And I want, God told me to give her the chance to share it with you. Good morning. I just recently flew in from Idaho where I was ministering and uh, had been giving a word, corporate word. And so this is the corporate word. Romans 8, 1 through 39. And this is all in the words of the Lord from the Holy Spirit. This is the word to cling to. This is my word to all who call me Lord. Hold fast to it now, for the enemy seeks to destroy, but his every attempt will be thwarted. I am taking back what he stole away from my people. His false deceptions have crossed the line, and my fire will destroy his every tactic, maneuver, and manipulation to lure his victims into what would become their demise, void of my intervention. My arm is not so short it cannot save, and my anger is kindled, and my wrath shall come of it. I am setting the captives free. I tell you this because the signs are about to appear before you, and all who seek me out for their protection, deliverance, and peace. What shall you say to these things? If I am for you, who can be against you? Man says, call a spade a spade. I say, call to me, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things you do not know. That's where things are now. Those things that look bleak, overwhelming, devastating, incomprehensible, and uncommonly irreparable, are they really? You can do all things through my strength, beloved. Speak to your mountain, O ye my people. With a mustard seed size of faith, it will move and I will win your battles. Can't is not an option. You can do all things. I hide my people beneath my wing and they shall survive the storms that frighten them. All my people void of race, creed, or color. Morning comes with my fury, beloved. The earth will tremble and my angels will battle for men's souls. Children will be rescued in this season and evil shall burn in my holy fire. I say again, morning will come with my fury. Which morning do I reference here? Any morning in which I move to annihilate the enemy. My fury will come as needs dictate in the morning hour in a day's beginning. The day shall begin with my intervention that holds harm and unexpected devastation for my people. Yes, I speak of Israel here, but this is not confined only there, but shall come for my people wherever they might be as the season dictates. My angels are warring in the heavens, and their every assignment will be carried out to its completion. I will leave nothing untouched. Listen for my voice and heed my words, for they are not spoken falsely as the enemy would do. Learn to discern. Seek me, and I will show you the truth from the fiction the enemy would have you believe. Now is then, was and what shall be is determined by the actions which ensue where trouble hides in unseen places until it suddenly appears to carry out its mission. But I see all and I know all, every plan, whether good or bad. Knowing this, how could you fear the trouble that lurks about if you trust in me? knowing I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Yes, people perish where there is unrest, and in the chaos of war, most especially the vehemently evil war against my nation Israel at this present time. 
Blow the trumpet in Zion, you who are of the faith. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain, O Israel, my beloved people. Your deliverer is nigh and comes with fury to make your enemies non-existent. They shall be a non-existent thing. For if I am for you, my Israel, my USA, my continents, my islands, my desert lands, who can be against you? The Lion of Judah does not sleep, and my growl shall grow loud that the whole world will hear through the thunders in the heavens. My power shall be shown in the lightning that comes on a clear day. My signs await their entry, and my presence shall overcome the evil wrought of men. These are not pleasant days for most of the world, for every nation has its woes on many fronts. But I, the Lion of Judah, am coming to bring victory out of chaos, and peace out of turmoil, and light out of the darkness. Watch for it, O ye my people, for the wait is not long until it comes. I, the Lord, speak to you here, and I will not disappoint you. Let all that has breath praise me, for I inhabit the praises of my people. I can no longer postpone my intervention, as the evil streams from the enemy's stanchions continue to pollute the minds of men, who are vulnerable to such as this, and I must destroy them to save my people and their habitation. Does not my word say it? The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will say destroy. Deuteronomy 33, 27. I will destroy, seek me, and you will find me, when you search for me with your whole heart, Jeremiah 29, 13. For I am near and not afar off, Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24. I am your good shepherd, John 10, 1 through 30. I am that I am, Exodus 3, 14. No, I have all sovereignty and authority over all things in heaven and on the earth. And I am not lax in my discipline, nor do I contend with that which is of the darkness perpetually, nor void of a time when I must act. And this is that time. Woe be to those who are my enemies because of their deeds against the innocent for they shall perish in the fires of hell. To everything a season, a time, and a purpose. No man can stop it, and no man need try. And now I close with this word to ponder as time goes forward into the days ahead. What you know, you know, and this is good for you. But what you teach helps others to learn and this is good for them. Teach what you know, and speak what you teach, for there are ears waiting to hear, and hearts longing for a closer relationship with me. My blessing is with you, and my peace also. And out of my peace, pray for my people Israel, that their peace will also will come. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, and neither let it be afraid. This is the word of the Lord for the hour. In fact, I've seen several things spoke to me directly. And you know, always remember the word, you always apply it to your heart directly, not out of condemnation, but so that you can always get a check of it. So, and he spoke to me. One of the things I have been wondering, can I share it with you? One thing I've been wondering is, you know, I've been teaching for over seven years now. This style of teaching, it's different than a lot of stuff. Now, I'm not saying any more different than anywhere else. There's lots of gifts going. But God had me teaching this style. And I had began to wonder 
how many people, you know, they love that wild meat, even though they get manna. I'm joking with this. Even sometimes we get manna. You know, the Israelites, they got tired of manna, didn't they? And so I was wondering in my heart, I wonder if, if our congregation, if you guys really kind of tuned me out, you know, oh, I heard that before and on stuff like that. And, I'm, and I've been praying. So as the word came forth, it, it spoke directly to me. I have given you these principles. I don't know how the perfect wording, so, if, you know. And then I have these simple truths that I'm going to send people to you to straighten out their being able to understand. There's a lot of confusing and a lot of weird teaching out there. I mean, if you don't believe me, check it out. There's a lot of new agey stuff. Sounds like Christian, but it isn't. And so I'm not concerned about you. You're taught well if you listen and you do. But at the same time, we need to be in prayer for our body and the body of Christ. So this is a great word. Amen. Do you guys got your Bible, notepads, whatever you like to receive? You know, I find in my life, I like to take a few notes. I don't t try to write everything down, but I like to take a few notes, especially to the key things God pops up in the, in the sermon or whoever's teaching this sort of ministers and bears witness and helps me along the path of my adventure. Let me encourage you to treat your walk every day like an adventure with Jesus. And the reason why I talk about Jesus, I'm not leaving the Father out, but I'm talking about Jesus because he's the one that really, the Father thought about us, but Jesus created us. Hello? The Holy Spirit brought us to pass. And if you think it that way, Jesus is that man you see on the, uh, on the chosen. That Jesus that they got there is pretty close. And how he responds and interacts. Now, he might be not perfect, you know, but you know how he interacts and responds. You see, when I read my Bible, I see wonderful things that Jesus does and how he interacts. It's everything we need within those scriptures. But I'm also curious that when all is done and all they wrote down, the times they sat down with Jesus up by the fire and ate fish and Jesus opened his heart and began to one-on-one. -on -one. Now, God wants me to bring this up and I'm, I'm just following God here. I haven't even got to my notes. On the one-on-one, -on -one, why? Why? Because he fills in all of those gentle places. Now, think about our relationship now. Jesus is in heaven, but he's also in our heart. But it's not until we approach him, we have to make the approach that we can sit down in him and he can one-on-one -on -one with us. Now, this is what I call face-to-face -face relationship. And it's interesting in the New Testament. How many times you, you see and read, we come face-to-face, face-to-face. Now, when I have a conversation with you personally, who am I looking at? My wife? We're face-to-face. -face. So when you hear that term, it's not heavy, it's not... A, it means that you're actually sitting face to face with God, even though you can't see him. We see him by faith. We see him by faith. And let me have you give this scripture, write it down, I won't go into it. Second uh, Corinthians 3.18. We sit with him face to face. We see him by faith. Hello? And if you're having a problem, he looks a little like that, but happier. <laughs> Amen. That was done for me. A guy didn't even know who I was, but God gave him a vision, and he made this whole entire thing. I'll share that some other time during lunch. All right. We've been doing a series called Reigning in Life in Christ. It's amazing that the word of God that our sister brought forth from the Lord is exactly some of the stuff I'm going to be teaching. This is going to be called God's Unshakable Kingdom. How many know that God is building an unshakable kingdom in the earth. Now, let me give you a little history. This is important. You see, when Adam and Eve were given this earth, he took, see, I'm going to do it without taking too long. God took some of the earth because he made the earth for who? For his man. Now, we know other stuff happened in between that. So he made man out of the ground, out of the clay, and then breathed a soul a personality, and a spirit in him. Okay? So that before the earth had crusted over, the, the reason why he brought of the, I asked him, and he said, is my understanding, he said, 
He said, because the earth was made for man and man was made for the earth and I wanted something there in them to remind them that I've created them in from the earth and not a test tube. You see, I don't care what people say. You weren't created by our alien brothers in some test tube and they're running around planting earths everywhere. Now, come on, laugh with me. That's what's being taught out there. It is weird. And, and it, it's actually biblical, but I have to put it in the right perspective, what's an alien and everything. Going back, so, when Adam sinned, he gave the earth over to Satan. Satan is an actual fallen cherubim. He is God's enemy. He was God's real close associate. God created him to serve God. But he got a big head on him, pride, and he wanted to be served. So quickly, when Adam and Eve sinned, and you might really understand, this will help the Bible open up to you. When Adam and Eve sinned, they ate of a poison that Lucifer put in that tree. God didn't put that tree to test man. That's a lie. That tree was altered, either that or placed in there by Satan. And when it is ingested, it changes the DNA. And here's what God told me. This broke my heart. He says, my beautiful man created my image. If they, when they ate that, it reduced them a little bit higher than an animal in their flesh. That's why we have lusts and desire of sin. Because we ought to eat. <laughs> I'm joking with you. You follow what I'm saying? That's what drives a lot of man because the flesh has got something evil in it. Pinch yourself and say, as, as beautiful as you are, there's something evil in there. And you know there is. If you've been a Christian any length of time, your flesh has to be crucified so that you can live up out of yourself. Everyone say, I'm a seed. I'm a seed. And I live and I'm breaking loose. So what is a seed? We're going to cover that later. Amen. So here's what happened. So when Adam gave the earth that Satan, he sealed it from God. And if you read the Old Testament, you want to know why God seemed so different in the Old Testament? Because he was dealing with the devil and Nephilim and all kinds of crazy creatures that Satan was making. Remember, he took the planet from Adam. Yes. So what was he doing? He was making and trying to get dig in and get all that taken. So another kingdom needed to come. God's kingdom needed to come. Replace Satan's kingdom. And that's why we have Jesus. So we're going to learn about the unshakable kingdom that God brought at Pentecost. We're going to learn about how he builds the unshakable kingdom within your heart. It's by his word. And if we're never in the word, we'll never have the kingdom built in us. So you'll be what I call a sloppy, agape Christian. Anytime something happens, you fall apart. Why? Because you have no prayer life. Nobody's helped you to really learn the disciplines of the kingdom. They're not hard. How many know you just can't keep breaking the law without a ticket? Yes. So, someone say amen. Yes. All right. I, I know I bored you already. So here's what Jesus did. When he came, he died, he rose again. He instilled a new kingdom. He instilled a brand new kingdom. And he brought it at Pentecost. It's called the kingdom of heaven. Everyone say kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven. Now that's not the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is the big one. Kingdom of heaven is just the little one given to mankind to replace Satan's kingdom in the earth. Hello. And you want to know why that rushing mighty wind? God said to me, because the kingdom came. All the giftings, all the powers, all the glory, the Holy Spirit, God, came into the earth to teach us about them. Now, he said this to me, oh, whoo, hallelujah. He said, the reason why I, I have you move in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, to learn about the Spirit, why the Word of God should be revealed to you by the Spirit. That was hard for me to get that out. To reveal the Word to us by the Spirit is because it's out of the eyes and the ears and the ability of Satan to hinder it. That's why God says for us to walk in the Spirit, move in the Spirit, because it's a realm where Satan, not, Satan cannot go. Remember, he thinks he's all that. Yeah. Look what, these, what he's doing to the world. He's doing that to the world. Why is God allowing it? Because he gave the world to us. We're allowing it. 
What have you done at your family? Do you have a list of your family on your refrigerator? Do you pray for them every day? Hello. Do you have a job? How about all your clients? Do you have a list of them on your refrigerator? Do you pray for them that they favor you? You see, if we don't instill the authority of God, if we don't pray, then God waits patiently. He says, okay, I guess you really don't care. Well, that's not true. Somebody has to teach us how to pray, how to flow, how to walk. Yeah. Guess what? That's where I come in. Yeah. Pray for me. All right, you ready to get in the word? All right, glory to God. All right, we're going to cover four areas. Then we're going to read our paragraph. But I got a dry throat, so I'm going to sip some grape juice. Gosh, I'm telling you, the Spirit's on me. Are you been praying for me? All right, we're going to read the, what we're going to cover, and then we're going to read our paragraph, okay? All right. Okay, we're going to cover these four areas. The kingdom is here. What does that mean? Two, the unshakable kingdom is here. We're going to talk about the unshakableness, what it is. I talked with a beautiful brother, and he was mixed up between the Old and New Testament. There's a lot of people that way. It's the whole thing. But you see, we can't practice Old Testament when all of those things are rejected by God. We have to practice New Testament principles. Jesus, as you have heard it said, you know, thou shalt have not committed adultery. But I said, if you even look at a woman, in other words, I have a higher principle, and I need you to understand. When Jesus, well, when he said to love me as you have loved your neighbor, frankly, I'm having a problem loving me. Come on, let's be, be funny about it. And can you imagine that? Okay. How can I love my, my neighbor? Jesus wasn't saying that. Remember what the, do you remember what the law was written for? We're Gentiles now. I'm not a Jewish person. Now. They're wonderful people. But I'm a Gentile. And I said, Lord, to a Gentile, why was the law written? To tell mankind he can't save himself. He needs to receive Jesus. Simple as that. Now, for the Jews, they have all of this that I needed them to strain and be clean. Don't eat these foods so they don't kill themselves. I'll bang me here so these Nephilim don't wipe them out. But for you, you're in the New Testament. You're supposed to walk with me. You're not supposed to be concerned on what you're going to wear and stuff. I'm your shepherd. And if I'm your shepherd, I'm supposed to take care of you. So listen, when I reach down to take care of you, you're off doing your own thing. Oh, it was a joke. Sorry. And so we have a lot of goats and a lot of sheep. And I want to be sheep. Can you say amen? I want to be following Jesus. Goats wander around and say it's God. Yes. Going to say that again. Yes. Don't wander around. We want to be with Jesus. Well, I'm not perfect. Sometimes I fall. God loves the imperfectness you have. That gets him to cuddle and cradle and help you. The key is the lies in our head that says, you've done it now. You forget the loving father effect. Our father loved us so much, more than you can understand, that he was willing to give up God, his son. Have him be born as a filthy man amongst all people who didn't respect him. How about you? You know why God has brought you up? Why he gave you a vision? Why you have a purpose? is to tell everybody around you that you are walking with God. They can see your change. You see, not yet last year's change. They need to see you change. As often as they see you, you're changing. You're metamorphosizing. You know, ask how Jesus did this. Now, I want you to get this, and then we're going to get into it. Jesus asked the disciples, didn't he? Didn't he ask his disciples? He says, what do you guys think? What are other people? You've been around everybody out there. What are they saying? Yeah. Peter opened up and he says, some say you're like, you come back, you're like John the Baptist, come back from the, some say you're Jeremiah's the prophet. You know, they're just piping it up because there was a lot of reincarnation taught, a lot of cultism still from Egypt and everything still around the Israelites. You didn't, maybe didn't know that, but anyway, so then he says, now you guys been with me. I'm paraphrasing. What do you think? Hello. Because their, their opinions were important. And Peter, you know what he said. You are the Christ. Is there anyone else? What is that? That's faith. 
oh God, that we all get to the place that we know that Jesus Christ lives in our heart because we asked him to come in. So you have to ask for forgiveness and ask Jesus in. Otherwise, he waits patiently all your life. And if you never do that, you'll never make it to heaven. I'm sorry. I would like to say you could get up some other way, <laughs> but no. Anyway, so anyway, God is just waiting to have a relationship with you. But don't get confused between religion and a relationship. Folks, who do you think the author of religion is? Say it again. Amen. Say it again. Amen. Exactly. Religion appeals to the flesh. You see, my way's better than your way. Your way's better than mine. There's division there, and the serpent eats. You're feeding him every day with your divisions, and you're arguing. Get with Jesus and shine and win souls, and let's get the heck out of here. Amen. Let's get into this lesson. And then, did I say did we get past three? How God literally lays out his kingdom in our heart, and then four, I went on a bunny trail, didn't I? And we're going to talk about the seven parables of the kingdom of heaven. Do you get that? Do I need to go through that again? Okay, all right. Because you, it's good. So we're going to cover each one of those points. So let's turn around and look at this beautiful scripture. That was a cue earlier. Okay. We're going to look at two. So this is Matthew. Matthew is a beautiful scripture there. Jesus is revealing the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples came and they said to him, why do you speak to them in stories or parables? And he answered and said to them, because it has, now listen how he answers, because it has been given unto them, no, unto you, to know the mysteries. The word there, you've got to understand, those are hidden teachings. Everyone say hidden teachings. Hidden. See, they're mysteries to the devil. So they're hidden teachings. So whenever you see the word mystery, it, it means hidden from something. Okay, you got that. So to you that know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them who are not born again, it has not been given. Verse 12, for whoever has, everyone say, I have Jesus. I have Jesus. What's going to happen? To him more will be what? You see, there's a lot more to come for you. Don't get distracted and caught up in the world's affairs. Don't get arguing, thinking of yourself. That's a distraction. You're supposed to die out. Jesus is supposed to live on. Hello? Look what it says. It's beautiful. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and to he will have an abundance. You shall have life and have it more uh, abundantly. But whoever does not have Jesus... Have salvation. Have salvation of God. Have God. Even what he has will be what? Now, here's you, here you go. God never steals. He's incapable of it. Hello? He can't be anything that his character won't tell him he is. He's perfect and good. Who's the thief in the Bible? Yeah. So if you're not following God, who's going to steal from you? I mean, don't be stupid enough to think you can handle your life. Yeah. Hello? Right. Well, let's not go over some of the wonderful choices you made early on. <laughs> Me too. Come on, let's sober up. And look at this. Look at this. You see, your life's going to be ripped up. You're going to lose health and everything if you don't stay on that and put the nail on him. Listen, if you've got some nasty bug in your living room, you caught it in a cage... Worst thing you can do is let it out. Watch your mouth. All right, let's move. Are we going to the next one? First Corinthians 2, yeah. Boy, Carrie, you talk a lot. All right, First Corinthians 2, 6 through 10. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Everyone say, that's me. See, folks, there's two of you. There's the immature you. Come on, laugh at me. And there's the mature you. Now, let me explain. Who lives in our heart? The Bible says that Jesus came down to live in our spirit. And our spirit and his spirit became one, took out the sin. So we're a new creature in Christ Jesus. So we have the wisdom of God, don't we? Where is it at? It's right here in our spirit. It's not necessarily all in our head yet. It's got to come up here. And it's not necessarily are we walking through it. But look what it says. We speak wisdom among those who are mature. You are mature in the spirit, 
but in your own understanding, ah, we got to learn. Okay, just remember that. That's why people get, um, when they talk like they know it all, all the time, is they really don't, but they need to feel like they do. All right, so it's okay. All right, yet, the, not the wisdom of this age. You know, the word age means in the time we live in this particular passage. So however we speak wisdom among those who are mature in the spirit, yet not the wisdom of this age, how we're living now, nor are the rulers of this age, those in charge. You took it before I finished. That's all right. Maybe it fell on its own. Is it still there? Thank you. Okay, and who are coming to nothing? How many know the world's coming to nothing? Yes. All right. And so here's what's going on. I need to tell you this. God has perfectly got things all set up. Now, it doesn't look like it, but we walk not by sight and not by our hearing. We walk by faith in the Spirit. Don't you know that Jesus... The whole thing of what Jesus went through was a trap to completely strip Satan and his kingdom. Not only did God give back us that love him, purchased us, but he purchased the world back. Okay? And then 40 days later, he established the kingdom. Are you with me? And so he wants us to walk in his kingdom, but we got to understand what it is. The kingdom is set up so Satan can't enter it. But we have something hanging out and something hanging in. We're in the spirit, but we're also in the flesh. I'm not talking about the nasty part. We're in the natural. So we have whatever we put our attention on is whatever we're in. Say amen. If I get and get in the car, where am I? If I get out of the car, where am I? If I'm in Christ, where am I? So why do we act like we're not in him? Why do we talk like we're not in him? Why do we walk around still in the, in the natural, not thinking that we're really dwelling in a kingdom under kingdom authority, under kingdom power that Satan can't get his little fingers in? But no, we walk out there and we kind of just get bold and loud. Amen? And the enemy goes, oh, that's not Jesus, that's Gary. All right, you ready to miss? Okay, let's go to the first point. The kingdom is here. Mark chapter 4, please. Jesus is talking and he says, To what shall I liken the kingdom of God? And look at this next phrase. This is beautiful. Because I teach in pictures. Jesus teaches in pictures. He gives explanation, parables or pictures. See the picture. But you'll never see the pictures in the scripture if you don't have the Holy Spirit revealing them to you. You have to pray a little bit before you read your Bible so the Holy Spirit can get in close enough to you because in the flesh, we're not pretty. So he can bring us up into the Spirit and show us what he wants to give us. You see, what God is going to give each one of you today is something special, but it'll be different than everybody else. You'll get something out of the sermon that nobody else will get. That's the Holy Spirit's job, to begin to minister the word to you personally. Say amen. And if it's a good minister, he's able to get that out by the Spirit and minister. You'll go home built up. You should never go home from church beat up. Should be built up. Say amen. Amen. Ooh, man. Shirley, are you praying for me? All right, so look at this. And he says... What shall we liken the kingdom of God? So how do we liken it? And what shall we, this parable, shall we picture it? Do you see it? Picture it. Now what is hope, Pastor Kerry? Hope are pictures. Faith is the substance of the pictures you see. If they're negative, there won't be. But the pictures, the things that we stare at, paint pictures. And if it's the word of God, your hope goes into God and your faith gets you there because God is working your faith in you. So you see, you're not working your faith. This is the fallacy. No, you're turning your faith loose by letting God work it in you. You just go in the presence of God and he turns the faith up. And then he says, Shirley, I want you here. And Carrie, I want you saying this. I got a place for you today. 
Peggy, pay attention. I'm talking to you. <laughs> Amen. Those are important. Why? Personal, personal in the spirit. God has cut Satan out in that kind of communication. We're to live, walk in him. We live, in him we move, and in him we have our being. So we've got to stop thinking that we're living for God and start letting God live through us. All right, so what do we picture it? It is like a mustard seed. Now, you guys know the story. Which, when it is sown on the ground in the earth, it is smaller than all the seeds in the earth. And when it is grown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs. It shoots out great large branches that even the birds of the air, I got the hiccups, may lodge in it. He's talking about Jesus. First of all, he's talking about the first mustard seed. You couldn't see him. He was born in Nazareth. Who in the heck comes out of Nazareth? That's what they said. Hello. Anything good? And God pulled out a little mustard seed. May God transform himself into a man, born of a woman, born under sin, without sin, to die for our sin. The mustard seed's on the ground, the earth. Hallelujah. What does it do? You and I receive them. Others receive them through the years, hundreds of years. And it grows up into a great kingdom. Huge kingdom with many branches. And the branches after a while, those die off and new branches are coming forth. What are you looking at? What do we see? I am the vine and you are the branches. His banner over me is love. Hello? You're a bush. You're a, you're a tree. You're a growth of God's beauty. Say amen. Whether you think you're beautiful or not, you are beautiful to God. Because you only have the gifts that God has given you to express. So what does the devil do? He messes our head up so we never find who we are. We're out searching somewhere in the stars. We're letting other people that are human who can't get their lives together speak into our life. Listen, if the person is teaching you, doesn't have their life together, smile and say, let's pray together. Don't, don't get taught by somebody whose life's not together. I don't claim my life is fully together, but I don't run out and rampant sin. And you wouldn't have any faith in anybody who just got off the bus. Can you say amen? And, and I just got off met, meeting my beautiful sister there, and I said, you got to listen to me. Boy, you're unshaven. You don't smell very good. Why do I have to listen to you? You see what I mean? We have to know that who we're listening to really is who they say they are. And you can tell a tree by the... Notice he calls us trees. He's always going into branches and trees because of the growth factor, how we grow and develop fruit. And here's Scott, man. He's starting to produce. and He's doing all this great stuff. And Scott, by the way, God wants me to say to you, haven't I not fulfilled your prayers? Haven't I restarted everything? This is a new start, my son. I have much growth and much greatness ahead. You look to man too much. You need to look to me. And then you need to take what I have given you and you need to keep it before me in prayer. That's a little word. It's a good encouraging word. God's got, God, I don't want to tip the devil off, but he has tremendous. The reason why God has certain gifts. Some people do certain things. Some raise money. Some have money. Some people are servants. Some people get things done. They drive people places. Everything has its purpose. You see, and if we don't let the gifts operate, then God's body's not going to be whole. We're going to have a lopsided bush. And we don't want that. Can you see amen? All right, so let's go to Acts chapter 2 now. This is when the kingdom came. I want to kind of emphasize a couple of things. I get so excited about the word, don't you? Yes. All right, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. It has a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where these people were sitting. There was 120 there. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. Was it real fire? No, it was spirit fire. We'll explain sometime later. Okay? Divided, divided unto them as a, a, a fire, and it sat on each of them. And they were all filled. Everyone say Filled 
with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave him utterance. There's a lot there. And please, don't be afraid of what God gives. Everything he gives is good and perfect. You see, it's that fear the enemy wants us to always doubt God. Remember, Satan's job doesn't have much power, but he's trying to convince everybody to hate God, to not believe in God, to be angry at God. And the reason, and he uses religion. You see, if I was religious, instead of saying, hey, welcome, child of God, I'd be saying, where are you from? There's a religious crust, and all of us have seen it. Don't think that that's what a Christian is. That's what a religious person is. So please, how many here have been bit by a dog? <laughs> no hands. That's scary. I've been bit three times by a dog. Anyway, how many know just because something bites you, they don't all bite you? And so remember, we're all potential children of God, and there's some pretty mean people out there. But you and I's eyes are not supposed to be on people. Why? Because we can be deceived with our eyes. Gosh, let's say I have a friend in high school, and man, this friend, a good buddy, oh man, him and I, I found out he's a serial killer. Really? We'll talk about that sometime. You heard of the Green River Killer? Man, make you think. you got a pastor who's been a, a, a lot of places and with a lot of very authoritative people. You know the guy that was head of the IRA there, remember in Scotland and Ireland, and we're fighting the Catholics against the Protestants? Do you remember any of that? Back in the 80s? Guess what? You know what God had me to do? I flew into New York to go to Israel, and when I flew into New York, I rode a bus with the guy head of the army. I forget his name. He sat right next to me. He says, what are you here about? I says, I'm here to go to Israel, learn more about God and my roots. And I said, what are you doing? He's, into, he's got this briefcase handcuffed to his hand. I know right away that's kind of wild. And he's in a full uniform, and he's got a bodyguard. I says, what are you doing? He says, I'm buying ammunition and guns. I said, well, who are you? He says, I'm the leader such and such of the... Irish Republican Army. Now, I don't know much about that at all, but I'm thinking, here I am sitting with that. So I put my hand on him. I said, can I pray for you? Now, only somebody like me would be as ignorant as that to lay hands on somebody who's a general who shows me a bag of money handcuffed to his wrist. That's who we are, you see. We're ambassadors not to be controlled by the world system, but to bring change. Yeah. We're to bring Jesus. Why? Because they've been rejected them. Yeah. Have you seen what happened to the people throw God out of their life? If they're still alive? Moving right along. So, at the day of Pentecost, it fully come, and they were all in one court, and suddenly came a sound from a rush, a rushing mighty wind from heaven. We know what happened. That was the kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit of God, Actually, the Holy Spirit, which is God. All of the gifts, all of the callings, and a portion of the kingdom of God was brought in through the resurrection. Forty days later, the Holy Spirit came to the earth. Now, it's funny that it was Pentecost, Feast of Fruits. Why is that, Pastor Kerry? Do you know what happened on the first Pentecost? Scott, do you? That's when Moses went up into the mountain, got the Ten Commandments. Pentecost, the first one. I bet you you didn't know that. And guess what? Now we're in the New Testament, right after the resurrection of Jesus. A new covenant's coming into operation. A new kingdom of power and glory with all the gifts and all the callings if we're mature enough and humble enough to be taught how to use them are right here at our disposal. And the only, we have, the only way we have access is in the Spirit. So guess what? You can't be religious, fleshy, and you expect to get anywhere with God. He'll just be patient. You know, he's going to live forever till we get over our tantrum. We've never had a tantrum, have we? No, never. Amen. Let's be on. Amen. Okay, so yeah, I read our two scriptures. The kingdom is here. Say amen. amen. So say everything I have, everything I have. In, the in the spirit is in Jesus. Okay, so let's go through this again. 
because Christians don't get this. We brush over it. Every little word in the Bible are very important because they show purpose and location. So if I'm in Christ, where am I? So how come I don't feel like I'm in Christ? Feelings are deceptive. Why are you going by your feelings? Uh-uh, uh-uh. Go by your spirit like a little child and believe. You watch what happens. Let me ask you, do you know how to get in the spirit? Here's, here's the funniest thing. Some people think, well, I have to pray. Got to fast sometimes. I really got to get down there and worship a bit. And then I feel like I'm moving in the spirit. And yes, please do. But see, that's a, a calisthenic. That's an exercise. To get in the spirit, everyone, you want to try it? How many of you want to try it? Close your eyes and just whisper, Jesus, you're in the spirit. Well, I don't feel like I got anywhere. No, you just opened up in the spirit. Now you have to ignore everything physically, just a moment, till God locks in your head to spiritual things. He has to lift our thinking. How many know we can have a wrong opinion of something? Hello? And, oh, God, please don't do this. Don't try to follow Jesus by your perspectives, how you think it is. Let God teach you every step of the way. Say amen. All right, a couple points I want to give you. Number one, church, at the day of Pentecost, the first one, Moses went up, got the Ten Commandments. At this Pentecost, we got the New Testament, all its gifts, all its powers. Now we need to be in the Spirit, learn to live in the Spirit, and that's where religion has stepped in and taken over. All revivals have been stopped by religious opinion and arguing amongst themselves. You don't believe me? Check it out. Jesus said to his disciples, how come you couldn't cast that devil out of them? Boys, it's your unbelief. Remember we talked about this two weeks ago? How does unbelief come out of us? Through what? You guys, I see a blank sheet out there. If, listen, it, remember Jesus talked about that boy and the demon in that boy? And it, the disciples came to Jesus and said, we can't, what happened? We can't cast it out. And Jesus says, oh, faithless generation. So he cast the spirit out and everything. And so they came to Jesus. Why can't we cast it out? And Jesus said something really different. He says, this kind come forth by nothing except by fasting and prayer. He wasn't saying devils come out by fasting and prayer. Your unbelief comes out by fasting and prayer. Prayer amplifies the new man while fasting shuts down your flesh man. And God arises. Let God arise and your enemies be scattered. Let God arise and your enemies be scattered. Let God arise and our enemies be scattered. Let God, let God arise. It's a key. You have to let him out. You have to project Jesus out. And don't get your mind in the way. <laughs> your mind acts like a restrictor. And if your head's not educated, you're going to restrict your belief. So you don't want to do that. You say, Jesus, teach me like I'm a child every day. I'm not coming to you like I know it. I'm going to come to you like I want to know it. Did you hear what I said? Don't come to Jesus like you know it. Come to Jesus like you want to know it. And he'll show it. You can borrow that phrase. They come to me and I just don't know where from God. Are you ready? Point two. So at our Pentecost, power came. So since the day of Pentecost, way back 2,000 so years ago, the Holy Spirit's been in the very atmosphere that we are living. You got to get a picture of this. Because it came in like a mighty rushing wind. The Bible says God's glory or presence is like the water covering the earth. Two-thirds. It's just, it's in what we breathe. Now the problem is a person that doesn't have Jesus in them they have no ability to sift out what comes in and out of them. So when those that have Jesus, if they're focused on him, I said focused, very, very important point. If you're focused on Jesus, then when you focus on him, as you breathe, you're aware that God is coming and going and moving in your lungs and moving all around you. That's how he gets our attention. We're pretty beast-like. Remember I kid you about what Adam, Adam, you know, brought us just a little above about an animal. 
Amen. And what do you think the, the Antichrist is going to be like? He's going to be a satanic, inhabited, beast-like human. Hello? Read your Bible. It's good. Not ask me questions. I love them. Amen. One at a time, though. Okay. So let's go on to three. We can now understand the kingdom is here. Say amen. Amen. And our job is to be in the spirit, be trained by the spirit, so that you and I can get our needs met, our lives can come together, and God can reconstruct what we have damaged or the enemy's damaged in our past. Say amen. That's why you and I are not to go in the past and dwell in the past. We're to dwell in the presence with God. Then he lines out for us our future. Satan doesn't know. Listen to this. He doesn't know our future. Why do you think people go to seances and all? They're trying to find out their future, trying to change the future. Now, here's what the devil is doing. He's trying to affect your future, trying to make it turn out the way he wants. Don't forget his original plan is to turn us into a bunch of slaves. Satan's job is to turn us into slaves. And it's amazing that Paul writes in um, Romans that you, we are slaves to sin. Hello. All our life in bondage, thinking about death and where we're going to end up. Moving right along. <laughs> Let's go to point two. Are you getting anything out of this? Point two is the unshakable kingdom. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. This is beautiful. <clears throat> when they sing and I talk, I, I cough once in a while. And you got to remember too, I'm not, I'm not perfect. I'm just, this is just my vessel. This is not me. Aren't you glad? Because I'm not all here, Shirley. There's a part of me missing. Somebody asked me a while ago, they says, oh, I didn't know you had a foot missing. I says, I donated, I donated it to science. You know, got, got a good prop. That's how I got started in the light. Anyway, I'd have to repent if I said something like that. All right, unshakable kingdom. Now listen. Now, here are the authors writing to the Jews, the Hebrews which really didn't have a loving father understanding of God. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to just paint a picture. And here the author is trying to show them something beautiful that they hadn't seen before. Now here, let me set you up. You see, when, when Moses went up into the mountain, he received the what? The, the law, the Ten Commandments, okay, right? A different covenant, perfect co You know, the Ten Commandments are perfect. Problem is, we can't live up to them. That was the whole purpose, see. It, it, the problem is, is all of us think we're something. Look at your neighbor and say, I thought you thought you were something, but you, now you know you're nothing. Really, we aren't. We, really, God says you can't do anything without me. You can't even breathe. You can't do anything. How about just recognizing then and let me rebuild you up the right way instead of what society builds you up. Say amen, somebody. Amen. That's the truth. So let's look at this. Verse 12, I'm excuse me, verse 25. See that you do not refuse. How many know that we can shut our ears to things? Now this is God speaking through the author. And he says, see that you do not refuse or shut your ears to him who speaks. For if they in the Old Testament did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth and through Moses, much more shall we not escape, get raptured, be taken out of here, if we turn away from him, Jesus, who speaks from heaven. This is a message about listening. You see, God speaks to us in the spirit. Many ways, through his word, still small voice, through others, he speaks through me. You know, but it's in the spirit. In other words, you can pick out in the spirit as the spirit gives it to you, certain things that God gives you. That's what we're supposed to do. When you go to the marketplace, you pick out what you want, sweetheart. <laughs> Make sure it's ripe. And you pluck it out because it's fitting what you need for dinner, what you need for your life. Get the parables. God uses everything to point to him. Everything. Even that what the enemy does, he uses that to embarrass him to point to his son. See the contrast. All right, you with me? Okay, he speaks from him. Now look at this. Those who, whose voice then shook the earth back in the Old Testament, but now he has promised saying, yet once more, and this is where we're at right now, right now at this time, 
Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. Verse 27, know this. Real strong Greek word means if you don't understand anything, get this. Okay? Know this. Yet once more indicates the removal of those things, listen, that are being shaken. God told me, and it wasn't very long ago, the reason why we saw hell on earth for a little while, all this stuff, people threatening one another, rioting and all that, is God gave us a little taste of what the flesh can do without God. Now, I'm sure we didn't need a taste of that, but he wasn't showing us, per se. He was showing the world how man can get out of hand so quickly without having a relationship and a respect for God. Hello. How many here have a healthy respect for electricity? And you put your little finger in the zapper and you got zapped? You have a healthy respect. My dad told me a long time ago, two things I want you not to do. I won't tell you the one because... You know, I didn't do it, but the other one is just never make fun of God or the people that love him. So ever, ever. He says, you, when you start doing that, you break the favor of God pulling you to his heart. You sever that. You refuse what God is doing. He's calling all of us. All of us, your children. He's preparing the way. Are you going to listen and come? Oh, but I already hear. Don't stop. He's a shepherd. He's leading us. Somebody says, man, I came to Jesus. Yeah. And you know, he's way over here. Where are you at? We have to keep following him every day. All right, say amen. Yet once more indicates those things are being shaken, he's going to remove. Verse 28, look at this. Therefore, since we are receiving a what? A kingdom that cannot be so you see, God builds that kingdom that he's saying here in our hearts by his word. That's why Jesus says, he that heareth my sayings, and he does them. I'll show you to whom he's like. He's like a wise man, builds his house on the rock. For he hears the word and does it. Here's the word. Now, we hear the word, God says, and we try to do it and we fail. That's all God's requiring of you, to try to do it. You're healed, but if you don't get up and walk around like it, he can't bring that forth because we have faith that has to have the actions that follow even if you don't feel like it. Got it? I'll let you kind of eat that a little bit. It's just a good thing to meditate on. All right. Now we're receiving this unshakable kingdom. Where do we build our life? On this kingdom. Where do we walk? In this kingdom. Can you say amen? And we walk by the Spirit. We live by the Spirit. And God is teaching us how to do that because we've lived in the flesh for so long. We've been with ourselves. I'm my own best friend. There's a friend at midnight, you know, when you go with the loaf of bread. You know who the friend is in bed at midnight? Your flesh, your own best friend. Sometimes you don't want to get up when God wants you to minister to somebody. There's a go, a good understanding of that. All right. Amen, sister. All right. A couple of, couple of points underneath this. Point one, God speaks to his children through his word. He does. He gives us a general knowledge. Now, I told a brother the other day, you can't dwell in the Old Testament because that covenant is fulfilled. It's beautiful, it's wonderful. Just pull the Jesus part out of there. Pull the promises of Abraham out of there. And then walk with Jesus. Let him show you your part. We receive word. The word helps us understand, gives us light. And we build our house on the word. God's building the kingdom. But as we pursue it along on a daily walk with God, he is literally helping us to keep and build that kingdom. So literally, your life is being rebuilt from the inside out. Say, I'm being rebuilt. being rebuilt. And the more you open up to him, even no matter where you're at, how long you've been in the ministry, just keep up, open up. Because he's real rebuilding places in your life where you don't know to ask him to fix. Smile up at me. There's those little closet places, you know, how nasty you get when so-and-so calls you. I'm, I'm just kind of joking with you. So allow him, invite him into every area of your life and soul where you might not know you're wounded, where you might know, not know you're broken somewhere. 
and let him come in and clean you because he's your loving physician. Say amen. All right. So let's go to point three. How God builds his kingdom in us. Go to Matthew 13 again. Oh, I love this. This is a, one of the most beautiful parables. In fact, in Mark, in Mark, it tells us if we're going to understand any other parable, any other story about God, we have to understand the parable of the sower. Hello? The one who plants. What are you and I planning? Are we planning the word of God? Your testimony? Yes. Amen. Okay, let's get into I just love this. Let's get into this. Matthew 13, look at verse 18. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word, notice you have to hear it. Here's the word of the kingdom and does not understand it. The wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. In other words, when you come to church, you come to listen seriously. Otherwise, it just, no, I'm just going to tell you, it just gets into the surface of your thinking. And the enemy can quickly make you forget it or, or pluck it out. It doesn't have to even say or do anything nasty. What was that that Pastor Kerry taught on today? Uh, hmm. I know it's good. How many people have you asked coming out of those mega churches what exactly they got? Well, maybe the first four rows. The rest, I don't know what they got. You see, Satan's crafty. We're against him, not people, not other churches. We're against him, and he's a master at playing head games with people. Head games. Master at it, getting you distracted. Don't look over there. Look over here. Look at that fault of that pastor. See, he's not all that, and now you miss all the word you just got. Because the enemy's got you now looking at faults instead of listening to the word. Are you with me? So let's follow on. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of God or the kingdom and does not understand it, Satan knows this and comes immediately and snatch away the word that was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. In other words, oh, I went to church, la, 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 la. It's great. I love God. Now listen, this is usually the second generational Christian. Mama's daughter or son who's been dragged to church. Hello? They, they're there. They participate. But man, when they got that freedom, right. off the wall, they go, oh. Yeah. Understand, second generations are, are under attack now. Pray for your children and your children's children and your children's children. And for those children's children's children. Right? Amen. I think that's right, Peggy, right? And, and, and Shirley, and some of us, Younger ones. All right. Follow me now. Look at this. Okay. And those that receive the word, uh, who receive the word, seed on stony places. Get this one. Did I pass one? The wayside. But the, who receives seed on the stony places is he whose heart, the word who have received the word and who immediately receives it with joy. Oh boy, happy, happy, happy. God is working on me. But see what happens, the enemy arranges something from them to experience that's really negative. Hoping that he's going to dig that word out of them and they're going to be discouraged. That's why we have to keep an eye on the younger ones. They should be here and are not because the enemy does that every day with them. And you have to pray with them. You have to put them in God's hand and keep them there. Say amen. It's not something you just think about doing. Please keep them there. Stop yanking it out of God's hands. Now, let's go on past this. This is good. Then it goes else. So these are the stony places. Look how he describes them. They hear the word, receive it with joy, yet have no root in themselves. They don't let it develop. In other words, Sherry, they have no consistency. You see, what a lot of Christians suffer with is being in the habit of God. They don't get in the habit of God. 
They get into the habit of meeting with God when things are not going right. No. You get up, present yourself to God, and get in the habit of God, working with him throughout the day. Hello? The people that don't do this are going to fail in this last day because they're trying to live for God without God living through them. It does not work. It's called religion. God, I'll pray twice as hard tomorrow for a hamburger today. Come on, laugh with me. Now, if it hits you on the toe, God will heal you. Okay. It goes on, he says, so those stony places, they endure for a while, but after tribulation, persecuted, rise for the word's sake. Immediately, they stumble and they fall away. Look at the next one. And those that receive some, uh, these are us. Those that receive seed among thorns, though they hear the word, but the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other attractions and desires entering in. You know what happens? When we let other things into our life too, Satan has them, Satan has them designed. They're called terrors. When we allow cares, worries of life, and in riches or wealth, I mean, because as a way of making us feel that we have arrived, you've got to be careful. Riches don't know anything. The devil uses them. And the last one is the deceitfulness of riches. They come in where? Into our attention, into our life. And what do they do to the word? They choke the word. I go, I've been to churches where the people attend faithfully. But the word's so choked off in their life, they're just sitting here like a dead stone. Now, I'm just kind of giving you a general idea. You're a lively stone, remember? And you know what? If you let everything that the world's trying to say choke God in you, then it's something you're doing and not something the devil's doing. He needs us to help him. Moving right along, packed. Okay, a uh, couple of points underneath that. So, how many here are good ground? God said to me, not more than a week ago, he does everything by the Spirit because he is a Spirit. He's thrown Satan out of heaven and out of the Spirit realm. Do you know that? How many of you know that God threw Satan out of the Spirit realm? Well, how can he appear spiritual? It's a deception. L believe me, I have lots of training in it, so if you want to go in a conversation, we'll do it outside of the camera and stuff. But he's, a, he's got a master computer, and he's full of deception. Okay, so we can't be paying attention to what he's doing because he's using the little pea in the shells. He's doing this to everybody's attention. Remember, he's a snake. He's a serpent. He's a lurewer. So his job is to get your attention. God wants to get our attention. First, we have to turn our life to Christ and ask God to teach us by his spirit. And then everything God downloads to us is downloaded by the Spirit. How many here ever downloaded something? On your phone? Come on, say amen. Yeah. All right. Do you know why God moves by the Spirit? Because when you receive the word by revelation, it goes direct download. It goes directly on good ground. Because he bypasses your head, bypasses your flesh, and goes right into your spirit. That's why we're to learn by the Spirit of God out of the ears and eye shots of the devil and pay attention to what we do because we tip them off and begin to move with our shepherds. Say amen. And if everybody did that, all these churches did that, we'd have a revival like you never saw before in your life. And that's what I'm believing for. Can you say amen? I'm about done with you. Either that I'll fall over. Amen. So God is building his kingdom, but you've got to be good ground. Say amen. So you know how to be good ground. Okay? By getting in the spirit. So before you open your Bible, before you, you sit down with God, just pray a little in the spirit. Just ask God, worship a little bit, and let him snap you up into the spiritual realm where the word of God was written. See, it was written to the spiritual. Why? Because otherwise it just appears almost a, an enigma, a, a mystery but it's revealed by his spirit. Paul said, I didn't get it from flesh and blood. I got it by the spirit. God took me up into places, showed me things. That's why I want you to learn that way. 
Sure, I want you to read your Bible. Sure, I want you to pray. But when God reveals special things to you, that's him revealing that word on good ground that the enemy can't get his hands on. Everything God set up is out of the reach of Satan's kingdom. It couldn't be. He didn't stick you here to experience the devil. He stuck you here to put the devil under defeat, de left one and de right one. In your life, drive him out. And listen, when you fight the enemy, don't wave at him. Don't scream at him. Don't think you're doing the hop a top a chupa pa. Just whisper the name of Jesus. Say, Jesus, I need you to go in. The enemy's trying to get in this way. And Lord, all you need for me to do is ask you to, to go in on behalf of them. Yes. To send you in a second like missile. See, we send God in. He does the work. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we're covenanted. And Lord God, I send you into so-and-so. Lord, you know in their heart what they need more than anything. How they think, how they reason. I want you to go in and begin to reconstruct their life and, Lord, begin to bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I also bind all the spirits that are evil from their life and remove their assignment. And now I take them and place them behind the curtain and I bind them there. I forbid them to come back. Now I release their angels who are ministering to every human being, their angels that they have bound, I release them. Now bring them to a place of hearing and growing in the Lord. That's how you pray for your children, your relatives. That's how you pray for loved ones. Man, you are the most powerful people in Christ there ever could be. How can we be so distracted to think God's bringing judgment and he's doing this and all that stuff? Well, of course he is. But we're supposed to be about the power of God. He says, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. If I want you to know, I tell you. But I want you to know the power. But you shall receive power. You see, we don't see that. Stop worrying about when I'm coming and how I'm coming. Start getting with me so I can show you you can bring me to come. Do you know we can bring God? You do know that, don't you? Do you know you can change the weather? You were designed to rule the planet. You see, Christians, we've been too much religious lately. We don't have enough truth. So let's stick around. Well, let's teach you some truth. Can you say amen? All right, let's go to our next point. So God builds his kingdom in us. How? How, everybody? No, I, I think I'm going to have to teach it again. By his word. If you're never in the Bible, you're never reading it, you're never walking it, then the kingdom is not being built in you. The kingdom is here spiritually. But it's the strength and stability of your life is built by the word and your understanding of it. When I look at you and say, how's our, the kingdom built in us? And you're all looking at me with a blank stare. That's scary for a pastor. God is good. Do you love me? Let's get in a little deeper and then we'll call it a day. Let's talk about the seven kingdom parables. Now, people, these parables are not hard at all. We make them hard. They're a simple story that Jesus is telling, and he's talking to his disciples. Now, they understand them in the spirit, but they have no clue how he's and why he's referencing these things. But guess what? The Holy Spirit's here with us, and he can open our eyes, can't he? So let's look at some, just some simple little nuggets and treasures in here. You ready to have some fun in the Word? Okay, here they are. These are the seven kingdom of heaven parables. They're listed in Matthew 13. I'll list them. The parable of the sower, the parable of the wheat and the tares, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of God's uh, leaven and Abraham's promise, the parable of hidden treasure, and the parable of pearl of great price, and the parable of the dragnet. All of them deal with a, uh, I got the hiccups again, with a space of time. Yeah. You see, when it says, let me tell you about the coming of the Lord. The coming of the Lord is a period of time, has several events in it. The coming of the Lord starts first with the rapture. 
then the tribulation, and then his second coming. All of that's called the coming of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord's different. All these things is my class 101. Okay, anyway, but you just know the phrases a little bit. But look what this says. This is very important that we get this. All these kingdoms, all these parables show us how God builds his kingdom within us. Number one, the parable of the sower. We just kind of read that. God needs you to be a good listener and a good, obedient child. Say amen. Remember the two children? God, the man went to the one child and said, will you go work in my field? He says, I will, I will, and then didn't. And then he went to his other child and he says, will you work in my field? And he didn't want to, but then later changed his mind and went. Which one is he talking about? You. Because there are times you, God asks you to do something, you don't do them, and you don't get rewarded for it. And there are other times that God says, do this, and we really don't want to, but we know we should, and we do it. The idea is we get to know what God is asking and getting in the flow of God's steps. Can you say amen? So the parable of the sower is literally builds God's kingdom in you. Say amen. The next one is the wheat and tares. Now this is pretty deep. Wheat and tares. Uh, wheat is something we can eat from, it, but a tear looks like wheat, but you can't eat from it at all. Say amen. Wheat is something that God that's God's harvest, and there's so much here that I don't want to spend all, forever. But tares are a copy. They're a hybrid. Hello? Hello? Did you know, don't get mad at me, when Adam fell, who entered Adam's life? When Adam fell, who entered Adam's life? Satan did. He became a hybrid. He became a fallen being. See, we forget all the religion hides all that, makes it all, you know, little fairy angels flying around with little, it's all, that's just a lie, okay? There's a real war that went on, okay? Now, you, what you got to get and what you got to understand about this is God does things in the spirit, Satan's a counterfeiter, okay? Satan's a counterfeiter. He's been working ever since and even before the creation of man to try to create his own man. Are you aware of that? Hello? What do you think cro Magnaman and all these zigabagabones are that they're fine? That's Satan's creations that fail because he can't create anything. He, he mimics God, but he doesn't have the life of God to live. So he creates these things and they die. If you don't understand, all through the Bible, all through the Bible, and we, it's just hidden. You have to be in the spirit to see it. It's not strange. It's just, it's exactly what Enoch, the people before Noah's flood experienced. They had a weird world. Did you know? We can't go into detail. So the tares and the wheat are talking about real humans and not human at all. I was always taught it deals with saved and unsaved. You see, God looks at a human as a possible salvation. He doesn't look at you as not. He goes after you until your dying breath. It's whether we wake up to him or not. But these are not human. Now, I don't know if you know anything about the Bible. Why did God in the Old Testament destroy all those people? Because, now listen carefully, I wish our friend was here listening. They weren't human. They were hybrids. They had mixed the DNA with angels and produced a thing called a Nephilim. Now, a Nephilim just means a fallen one. Satan is a what? A fallen one. He's a son of God. He's a ben He Elohim. He's a copy of the original Elohim. Say amen. And the original Elohim, or God, is Father, Word, and Holy Spirit. Now the Father has become, and the Word has become the Son. So those three are God. Nothing else, everything else is a copy made after God's likeness a little bit, and after God's Spirit, until Satan broke away. How many know that, God, that Satan at one time was a friend to God? Right. And he turned on him, huh? Right. And you know what? He attacked God. Now you know why? Satan attacked God? I'll tell you why. He was jealous of you and I. God was making an inferior mankind in God's image, so like God and so like his likeness, that Satan thought he was the one. And just to find out, surely was the one. 
How dare she got the promotion and I didn't. And there is you looking at Lucifer's fall right there. So he captivated the earth, started making armies. He dug in. That's where all our megaliths are coming from, all those undersea cities. And he began to attack God. Ezekiel 38 and uh, Isaiah 14. And God threw him right out of heaven. Back down on the earth and sealed the earth. It's now a prison. It is? The earth's a prison? Ah. Uh, nobody gets off here unless you have Jesus. Ah, uh, Satan made it a religion, see? You tell people about Jesus. Look, you're infected with a deadly disease that's going to kill you. I have the cure. Would you like it? Absolutely. Come on, pray with me. Let's receive Jesus. You see, we need to be evangelizing. They're sick. Everyone's sick without God. This is a hospital you're sitting here. So please don't look at the patients. <laughs> Laugh with me, says. Don't be watching the patients. We're all, we're all needing help. Are you still with me? Yeah. All right, so now the wheat and tears. So the day we're, we're actually living, and I'm going to blow your mind, there are people walking around that are not human. And that'll blow your mind because I ran into a couple of them. We'll talk about that sometime during lunch. Third parable is a parable of the mustard seed. How God builds his kingdom through Christ. The next one is the parable of the leaven. Do you know God put three leavens in the earth? First, the promise to Abraham. Second, the law to show mankind they can't save themselves. And third, grace came through Jesus Christ. Those are your three leavens that God put in the earth to leaven the whole lump. Say amen. I love things like that. I sit down with God and he shows me what they mean. That's the best way to learn. Say amen. And Satan can't hear a thing. Although he does watch my sermons. All right, let's go on. So he's going to try you probably during the week. See if you got any of this. I, I'm joking with you. All right, let's go to the next one. Yes, the parable of the hidden treasure. We're going to show that. And the parable of the pearl of great price. And then the parable of the dragnet. I'll cover them real quickly. There's so much there. Remember, there are space of time that these things are. You follow what I'm saying? There's just not one little small segment of time. The, when we talk about the pearl of great price, it starts from a time and ends at another time. But there's a whole lot of space between those two times. And the dragnet, same. We know the dragnet's going to be carried back into and all the things are going to be said. But the dragnet's already out there. And people's souls are still being thrown into it. Started at Jesus' resurrection. God's been collected in a great big dragnet. Those from every nation and every tongue, every tribe, those that love his son Jesus are all jumping in the dragnet. Can you say amen? Yeah. And he's going to be pulling it in short. So are you outside the net or in? Just jump on in. Okay, so let's go through this. All right, we covered the parable of the sower. We covered the wheat and tears. I think I got it for you. You're going to start seeing a real... Oh, I think God want, might want me to speak. Hold on. Okay. Sometimes he has me speak out, out through me. You're going to see a time. Have you noticed in the last three or four years how weird everybody is getting? I mean, in society, it's just different. We don't have just math. We got some weird thing nobody could figure out. Hello? Have you ever tried to go get a prescription and have a doctor's appointment? It seems so messed up and it's so broken. That's what the enemy's doing. These people, bless their heart, they're good people. But without God's guidance, we're all a bunch of lunatics. Don't get mad at me. You are. Come on, you know what you're like when you fly off the handle? Never, Pastor Gary. I don't do it anymore. Come on, you know what you were like out of control? Gee, have we forgotten where we came from? You know, when we forget where we came from, don't dwell on it, you'll repeat it. If you don't understand your problems from the past, we have a tendency to repeat them until we learn differently. Who's our teacher? So you got the parable of the uh, wheat and tares. Now the parable of the mustard seed. Who's the mustard seed? 
Jesus and his kingdom. What do we have right now? The kingdom of heaven. That's the mustard seed. It's been growing since the resurrection of Jesus. Say, hey, God, I don't want to go too much deeper. I do have a great teaching on it. I've done some a couple years back. Then the next is the parable of the 311. I told you what it was. First of all, for man to have hope, there has to be a promise. And God gave it to Abraham by promise. So when God fulfilled the Old Testament, he still is answering Abraham's promises. Hello. So even though the law has been done away with in Christ, not, not completely, but it's been fulfilled in Christ, that's a better word, that we, as we follow Christ, we don't have to about worry about do's and don'ts. This is what Satan wants. See, you be careful, don't do this, and be careful, don't do that, and that's our mind being occupied. No, God says, be careful, just meet with me and let me line out your steps. Boy, that's hard. I don't know how to do that, Pastor Curry. Just hang around, we show you. Just ask anybody here. All right, yeah, I got an amen there. So we know what those three Pieces 11, Abraham's promise, Moses' law to point to Christ, and then finally grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. And then the next one is a parable of the hidden treasure. Let me ask you something. Every tribe of Israel was giving a stone to represent their tribe. Say amen. And when you got a lot of stones collected in one place, you have a, a treasure. So the treasure in the field is Israel. And God raised out of nothing a, a nation called Israel and ascribed stones and jewels to those tribes as a description of them. There's far more than I'm sharing. And then when he says, I'm going to come and get them, he's going, he planted them in the earth and he's going to come and get his treasure one day. Rapture, he's going to come and collect his treasure. Can you see, man, that's the treasure in the field. Israel. Now the pearl of great, everyone say the pearl of great price. I love this. This is so good. When God showed me this. Now I'm from the land of pearls, oysters, all that, mollusks. And how are pearls made? I'm going to just be simple. Let's not go into detail. But how are pearls made is a little piece of rock is placed inside the captuation of the pearl, inside of the oyster itself, inserted in the oyster. And the oyster doesn't like it and starts putrating and spitting out some kind of, I don't know what you'd call it, and it starts forming around the rock so it doesn't affect the oyster. And it becomes a very beautiful pearl. And the more that oyster stays there, the bigger it gets. And it's spitting out and rejecting the oyster, but in it doing it, it's putting a protection that makes it a pearl. Jesus, he's the pearl of great price. We are a part of that. How? He's the irritant sand that came into the earth, the oyster. God inserted him into humanity. And he's been an irritant ever since. <laughs> and the world's been throwing him out and rejecting him. And every time they do, he becomes more treasurable, more of a pearl. And you know what? The stuff that is being thrown out on him is you and I. God is building his pearl of great price by piling human flat, human, excuse me, human souls and collecting us. And one day, like the church and the kingdom is all built like one big pearl. Say, I'm part of that. Now, folks, that's when God's going to reach down and pluck up the pearl of great price and place it in his crown. The treasure man created in his image and after his life. Now, God always honors Israel. But see, when we become a Christian, we're not no longer a Jew if we're a Jew. We're a Christian. We're a, we're a God man, God woman. Neither Jew, Gentile, bond or free, male nor female. We're all one in Christ. The idea is, is not to be in competition where Satan wants us to hoo, 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 and, and compete and all that, but be together as a pearl of great price where God puts you on the crown of his, his head. Can you say amen? And finally, the dragnet. The Holy Spirit is the master of the dragnet. He's thrown out a kingdom, which is the dragnet, into the earth. 
And those who accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, all the way up until this, the, the end of the millennium, because there'll be people during the millennium that will get born again, will all be thrown into that dragnet and pulled away from the evil. Now, see, here's the, the, the terrible fallacy. Be careful of them who teach you're going to go through the, tr the tribulations and the trials as a punishment of God with the wicked. Folks, the seven, now listen, I have to talk about it for a second. The tribulation is not for the righteous. It's for the wicked. And because the world has rejected the Jew and the, and the Christian, because they rejected the judgment, they release a judgment on themselves for seven years where God finishes his dealings with the Jew, he finishes up his dealings with the earth. And then at the end of that, guess who's coming? Jesus and us, we're going to ride with him. Meanwhile, we need to learn how to move, walk, talk in the spirit because God will need us to help share the gospel. Now, folks, I can get in the spirit. Doesn't take me long. And God will give me what to say, when to say it, and, to, and who to say it to. Remind me, don't be doing while I'm moving while I'm preaching. Amen. Yeah, it's all right. We're calling the fire department. And so anyway, you, you see what I mean? And so what basically God wants us to do is he's literally laid out for you and I a table to come and eat and be with him, to commune with him, right in the midst of Satan. But we have to go in the spirit. We have to go in the spirit. So you should be praying, Father, teach me how to get in the spirit, how to walk in the spirit. Teach me if there's something I'm hanging out in the flesh where the enemy's catching me all the time. Help me to clean that up. And you have to be the one that's doing it inside me. Help me, Lord, to work with you and help use me mightily. Now, if you've got something out of that this morning, will you give the Lord a praise? So there's 13 parables. <laughs>